us with you, Lord. It is with us. For your word is clear. Our hearts are the unclear. So we pray, Lord, for a time of looking into your word. We pray that we would be changed by it. We pray that it would not just be a hearer of it, but having heard that it would change something in our life for the sake of your gospel and your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Years ago, I was reading a book on Paul and I came across a illustration the author used that is one of those that you don't forget. And the illustration was he said he knew of an American uh, evangelist of sorts who was uh, evangelizing airports. And unbeknownst, he would, he would go up to people and ask them a stock and standard question. And the question would be something to the effect of, uh, when, when did you get saved? And people would answer, and presumably he would tell them, you know, how to get saved. Well, on one occasion, he, unbeknownst to him, had asked a man who was a preacher and preaching the gospel and a pastor, and uh, he was startled by the man's abrupt approach, he said, and so he answered to him, and his reply was, well, I was saved about 2,000 years ago, but I only found out about it recently. <laughs> and I never forgot it because it draws such a line in the sand between my actions that take place in the time period between my birth and death that'll be on my tombstone in the actions of Christ that took place 2,000 years ago. The man was appealing to the objective, historical events and works in person and work that took place 2,000 years ago the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Now, if that's your narrative, what we saw last time, then that's what you get. That's what you get. That's the kind of thing that you say. But if your narrative is the social justice narrative, you, as we saw, get a very different type of news, a very different action. And you get something like, what happened with Joaquin Phoenix in his recent Oscar speech that took place this month. I'll just read you a segment of what he said. In case you're looking for an example of social justice. He says, <clears throat> when talking about uh, giving, uh, getting this gift, he said, but I think the greatest gift that being in film has given me, and many of us in this room, he says, is the opportunity to use our voice for the voiceless. So here he goes into it. Um, not to mention committing the fallacy of a, a, a faulty appeal to authority. For some reason, if you're an actor, you're also a doctor and a lawyer and a theologian and everything else. So, <clears throat> so he goes on and he says this, I've been thinking a lot about some of the distressing issues we are facing collectively. I think at times we feel, or we're made to feel, that we champion different causes. But for me, he says, I see commonality. I think whether we're talking about gender inequality, or racism, or queer rights, or indigenous rights, or animal rights, it just keeps going. One day it'll be at grass rights, Bermuda rights, and ryegrass rights. We're talking about, here it is, the fight against injustice. The fight against injustice. We're talking about the fight against the belief that one nation, one people, one race, one gender, one species has the right to dominate, control, to use and exploit another with impunity. Now he goes on for a minute, but I want you to read this, uh, listen to this, to hear it for yourself. 
He says, we feel uh, entitled to go into the natural world and plunder it for its resources. We feel entitled to artificially inseminate a cow, and when she gives birth, we steal her baby. We steal her baby, uh, even though her cries of anguish are unmistakable. And then he says, we do what some of you did this morning. We take her milk that's intended for her calf, and we put it in our coffee and our cereal. And, and he goes on to say uh, that, that for many of us, this is our guilt. And, and so I, I don't know if you knew that uh, you're guilty for eating cereal this morning that came from a calf. Now, that's what you get if you have the social justice narrative. If the problem in the world is the oppression of groups and therefore the liberation, what we need is the liberation of groups versus your problem in the world being Adam and the solution being in Christ. Now, if that's your narrative, you get something very different than Joaquin Phoenix. You get Martin Lloyd-Jones. Here's what Martin Lloyd-Jones had to say in his commentary, which is his sermons on Romans 5, after he looked at his narrative. He writes, look at yourself in Adam. Though you had done nothing, you were declared a sinner. Look at yourself in Christ and see that though you have done nothing, you are declared to be righteous. That is the parallel. And then he says these incredible words. We must get rid of all thoughts of our actions. There is no boasting. We do nothing. All we are and have results from the obedience of the one, our Lord. <clears throat> to put it simply, if your narrative is the social justice narrative, then what you have to give to people are things that they need to do. Things that they need to do to affect change. If your uh, narrative is the gospel narrative, then what you have to give people is not do's, but news. What you have to give people is things not that they need to make happen, but things that have already happened. To, to crystallize it into two words, if your narrative is the social justice narrative, then you're, what you have to give people is, is activism. And if your narrative is the gospel narrative, then what you're about is evangelism. This is why, uh, if you just look at these words in our text, words like news, we, we often don't think about them, but you probably looked at the news this morning. It's not so you could have got on your Facebook news feed. You could have looked at the news on a channel, on the internet, or some source of news. And normally you're not looking for someone to give you instructions on life. They may say, this happened in the town this week, or this is happening. They're describing to you indicative statements about uh, things that are happening. And so that's the basic meaning of news. Um, in, in the Greek, the word euangelion, you, the, for gospel, the second part, angelos, where you get message. The good message is just a message. So it's news. Another word in the text is reporter. We know what a reporter is. A reporter's not telling you to do something. They're telling you what happened. The hurricane is here and here and there and this is going on. Another word that is in our text is preacher. In the Greek, caruso, a town crier, a sort of hear ye, hear ye, this is the thing. Which the reason they had that in their days, they didn't have Facebook. And that's why he's also referred to here as uh, a runner, a runner, uh, the, both a Jewish and a Greek background for this. You can read 2 Samuel and you know, Joab tells this man, no, you shall not bring, you shall not run, you shall not bring news to the king. 
And he tells the other man to bring the news. And so he runs and they're, they're there on the city wall and they see one coming and he's bringing good news and he's running and the man is coming. And that's why Paul refers to the feet here and not the mouth, you would think. Why not the mouth or why not the head? Why the feet? In our day it would be, except they're not often that beautiful, how, how beautiful are the keystrokes? <laughs> that, that's the means through which information goes out and so the feet they literally couldn't know there there's an ancient legend in the greek background of a man by the name of uh phidippides who uh at, at a famous battle of marathon the greeks defended themselves from the persians and then he ran some 26.2 miles I think it was to go deliver the news to the city of Athens that's how far it was for marathon according to the legend he this soldier ran all the way there and without stopping he gets to the city of Athens and he just simply stops and says we are the victors and then he dies and 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 these nervous people get the news and so that, that's the word here, a sense in which someone does not know what you are about to tell them. And they need you to tell them. There's a victory that has been won, but not heard. And God wants messengers to bring it out. And it says, which is why he says, notice the word of Christ. It's not the word of you or me, the word about Christ, which is why he also calls it good news. Because, and he also says it's about good things. It's about justification and redemption and propitiation and reconciliation. And what we saw last night, the union of Adam and Christ and us, all of these things are the good things of the news. This is why the entire New Testament is structured the way that it is. You ever looked at how it's structured? I mean, in general, just generally speaking, in the Gospels and Acts, you basically have the history. And then in the epistles, you have the commentary on the history. Who in here reading the Gospel of Mark would have ever known that they died with Christ. You probably need Ephesians for that. You probably need Colossians for that. Right? And, and so, yes, in a sense it's there, but it's sort of like a, one person has compared it to a, a football game. You know, you have the play-by-play -play happening down on the field, and then you have the commentators in the press box and they're explaining to you, this is going there, and look at what he did there. And that's what the apostles are doing. In, in the Gospels, you mainly get the facts. And then in the epistles, you get the meaning of the facts. That's the way Lloyd-Jones put it. To preach the Gospel is to not only preach the facts. And I grew up hearing the facts. I knew Jesus died. I had no idea what propitiation meant. I knew that he rose. I had no idea what Adam and Christ meant. And, and so people can hear the facts. It's not enough to hear the facts. We must make known the meaning of these facts. And this is why all who are here are preachers. The great task is to preach through the New Testament. Verse by verse, by verse. To preach the facts in the Gospels and Acts and to preach the meaning of the facts. The whole thing is preaching the Gospel. And so Paul tells Timothy to give attention to the preaching of Scripture. Give attention to the reading, exhorting, and teaching of Scripture. Now this is why, this line in the sand between my works and Christ, this is why we preach faith apart from works. Look at the way Paul puts it in that great statement in Romans chapter 3. Now he says something in Romans 3 that we, we, we should all be 
on board with in agreement with no, no matter how late we stayed up last night or how early we've been up this morning. We should all be in agreement with 328 and be maintaining that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law, right? You, you rolled out of bed with that. But why does he say that? Well, it begins with four. So we go back to verse 27. What was he saying in verse 27? That there is no boasting. Well, no, that has a then. Why was he saying there is no boasting? Because he just got through describing the finished work of Christ on the cross. And so there's a logic to the gospel. There's a logic to if a man understands the work of Christ, then he understands he does not need to work. And if he does not understand, he does not need to work. He does not understand the work of Christ. Isaac Watts put it best in his form of what Lloyd-Jones was saying. Look at yourself and Adam. He said, when I survey." the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. What? You get up and do something? No. My richest gain I count as loss and poor contempt on all my pride. There's no boasting to the man who has seen the cross of Christ. I like to tell people when we're out evangelism this came we were going door to door one day trying to explain to this man the gospel and i said look your your lawn is cut it looks really nice and and, and it looks like you even edged it and and blew it off and and all that's really nice lawn now the work is done and you probably are going to get some uh some lemonade or sweet tea or something come out here and behold your work it's very good and sit down on the porch or something. I said, now, this is all finished. Now, what if another lawn company comes up with all their equipment? And they, they start pulling out and cranking up. And, and, and they're ready to work. I, I, I mean, you would say, you can only mess it up. Right? There's nothing to cut. Because it's done. And Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The one piece of furniture that was not in the Old Testament temple is what you're on right now, a chair. He sat down and it's finished. And if it's finished, there's nothing to do. There's simply something to trust in. So there's a logic to it. That not only to faith and works, this line between what theologians call the Historia Salutis and the Ordo Salutis, the, the work of salvation that takes place in us versus the work of salvation that took place outside of us that is the basis of what takes place in us. Uh, Paul in Romans 4 tells us this is the key to assurance. Si was telling us last night, Paul was sure that nothing would separate him. Why was he so sure? Why could he tell Timothy, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he will guard what I've entrusted to him until that final day? How? He tells us right here. Again, it's this line drawn in the sand. Romans 4.16 For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace. And why is that significant? So that it will be guaranteed. Faith, grace, certainty. If it is all given to you as a gift, then it can actually be counted upon and not change. Right? But if it is based upon my performance, then, then that thing is doing this all the time. And you're tossed about by fear and doubt, which is why Spurgeon said the anchor doesn't do any good inside of the boat. You've got to throw it outside of the boat. 
And that's what you're doing in salvation. Looking away from yourself. Casting your entire anchor. Which is an anchor for the soul. Outside of you. And into Christ alone. And this is also why in the very near context of our text this morning. This news grows right out of it. Because Paul had been saying that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. How is he the end of the law for righteousness? Well, he's, he's the end of the law for righteousness sort of the way Joseph was the end of the search for bread in the story of Genesis because he provided it. And Christ is the end of the law for righteousness because he provides it. And then he goes to prove it from the law in verse 5 and 6 and following to say the righteousness that the law prescribed, do this and live, Christ has provided. He's, he's given that righteousness that gives life. So he says in verse 6, but the righteousness based on faith. So notice what's similar in the Old and New Covenant is righteousness. Similar concern. What's different is how it's provided in this text. One is by doing and you get life for doing. The other is by trusting and you get life for trusting. So he says the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Don't say, what will I do? How do you know you believe the gospel? Not even just what you said. Sai and I were talking about this. Uh, when, when my daughter was converted, she prayed in her heart. I didn't get a chance to tell him that yet. But so it had already happened. And I didn't even know. Because there's a saying with your mouth and there's a saying with your heart on the inside. And Paul saying uh, the true gospel preacher is concerned, we talk about a pastor concerned about his people, a true shepherd is concerned what they say in their heart. Is it well with you in there? What, what is your understanding in there? And Paul says, don't say in your heart, what will I go and do? What sacrament will I go and do? What aisle will I go and walk? What pilgrimage? Will I go and take? What virtue will I signal on social media? What march for what cause will I go to? He says, don't say that. But what is it saying? The word is near you. And he even adds, who will descend? Or don't say in your heart, who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. That means... Don't act like you're going to get on the cross with Christ and add suffering to His suffering. Well, i got to kick the can down the road for at least five minutes and be sad. No. No. That's just adding penance to His finished work. It's like finishing the Mona Lisa. It's like finishing... uh, it's like on the sand lot. You get the Babe Ruth sign ball in, and you want to finish it. You ruin it by touching it. It's finished. And so you don't have to perform. You don't have to mourn. And so Paul says, that is the word of faith which we are preaching. If you ever want to know if preaching is apostolic or not, This is the word of faith Paul preached. And he says, we, this, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. But look at this again, the meaning of it again. Verse 10, for with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness. Meaning, in the mind of the sinner, when they believe in the resurrection, it's not just the fact 
It's that God did not allow His Holy One to undergo decay. That made known to Him the path. It's, it's a confession of His righteousness. He lived. He got life. He's the Messiah. That's what Paul saw in Acts 9. He already had the categories. He just didn't have the person. And as soon as he saw Him, he knew He's the One. As Peter called Him, You are the Holy One of God. And so, Paul says, based upon that, based upon the fact that it's all done, this is why salvation is calling on the name of the Lord. Calling out in trust to what has already been done. So the, the narrative being done is what leads to the calling. This is why it's this way. So this is why we have news. And if this is why we have news, here's the point this morning. This news is necessary. This news is necessary. That's Paul's main point. And that's why he begins and ends in this text with the necessity of the news. It's like an inclusio. He begins with it and in between is the tragedy of the news that it was not all heated and the point that it comes together to just let me give you just one statement of truth that would be my one point this morning for you to take and that is this the tragedy of the news does not alter the necessity of it the tragedy of the news does not alter the necessity of it Look, first of all, at the necessity of the news, verses 14 and 15. Obviously, these are rhetorical questions, uh, which means they're not meant to be answered, which, which is obviously ironic that people still try to answer them. Well, here's a way you can be saved without hearing. You're like, these are rhetorical questions. <laughs> when a mom says, if you keep... Messing up the kitchen, how am I ever going to keep it clean? She's not looking for an answer. She's making a statement. If you keep messing up the kitchen, I can't keep it clean. And when Paul says, how will someone call on him whom they've not believed? He's saying they can't. And when he says, how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? They will not. And how will they hear without a preacher? They will not. And how will they preach unless they are sent? They will not. It's like on Peter Pan where the father says, if I can't find my cufflinks, then I can't go to the party. If I can't go to the party, I can never show my face at the office again. And if I could never show my face, at I'll stop. But that's a tell children. He's stringing together logical conclusions. So what about those who have never heard? Will God reach them through visions and revelations and things like that? Well, Paul covers that in 1 Corinthians 2, doesn't he? Another verse that's been often misunderstood. 1 Corinthians 2, he's, he's in this context going on obviously about the foolishness of the world, the wisdom of God. And he's been referring to the Gospel as foolishness from one angle. And so here in chapter 2, verse 6, he says it actually is wise, it actually is wisdom just from the world's perspective. It's not. And he talks about they didn't understand it, that's why they crucified the Lord of glory. And then he says in verse 9, he quotes the Old Testament and says, Things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. Now 99% of the time this is quoted to refer to the believer's hope in heaven. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's point is the Gospel has never entered into the heart of man. He's never seen it. 
He never heard it. He didn't think it up. God revealed it. That's the whole part, point of the mystery. Ephesians 3, the mystery being revealed, which was, what does he say in Ephesians? Hidden in God. It was God. That's why Romans 1 1 says the gospel of God, meaning it, its origin and source, it was his idea. And we have gender reveal parties today. So we know what it's like for someone in the room to know some information, and no one else can know that information until they reveal it. And that's how the gospel was the plan. No one just looking at those trees out there can come and tell you the God who made that is going to die on a cross for you. That has never entered the heart of man. But the God who made that did die on a cross for you. And it's so glorious and wonderful and the world is so sinful no one ever would have come up with it. He says it again in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God His plan, the world through its wisdom, some of them came to know God. No. Did not come to know God. Planned it that way. First Peter says you were born again by the incorruptible Word of God, the living and enduring Word. James 1.18 says that He brought us forth by the Word of truth to be a kind of first fruits among His creatures. And sometimes people use election to get out of it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Apostle Paul says it doesn't change there either. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren. We should be here singing songs like this because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by faith by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And look at this, verse 14. It was for this He called you through our Gospel. Called you through our Gospel. I got to do an a internship in cardiac rehab and uh, watch some heart surgeries and things. And when they do a balloon surgery, they first put a little sheath in the femoral artery. And then they run the little thing through there all the way up to the heart. And Paul's saying God always uses a sheath when getting to the human heart. He never goes to the human heart without the Word. It comes through the Word. Paul said He called you through our Gospel. This is why Jesus in Mark 13.10 says, this Gospel must be preached. That doesn't make sense any. This is why the, the Ethiopian eunuch, when Philip gets up in the chariot, he says, do you understand it? He says, how can I without a preacher? Amen. And he even had Isaiah 53 in his hand. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be saved just reading. But, it, but it's interesting here that primarily it comes through preaching and Paul, Paul doesn't say, how beautiful are the books? So the Gospel is to be read and written and hope we will read it, but it is primarily to be preached. God has chosen, He says in 1 Corinthians 1, through the foolishness of preaching to save. And some will look at Cornelius, but God sent Peter to Cornelius. And while he was speaking, the Spirit fell. Some will point to Abraham, not realizing, Paul says, God preached, actually not God, the Scripture preached the Gospel beforehand to Abraham, Galatians 3.8. Why? How could it happen? Because the Gospel was announced in Genesis 3.15. That was where the Word began. 
Adam and Eve didn't know anything about this plan. And as Jeffrey Johnson says in his book, before the, the rubble of the first kingdom had even settled on the ground, there was already a promise. So general revelation is insufficient for salvation. It's only sufficient for condemnation. There's only one thing. There's only one law of the Lord that restores the soul and therefore is sweeter than honey. Even the drippings of the honeycomb. And therefore Paul says how beautiful are the feet. That's why he says it. It's what makes them beautiful. Now the translation here is somewhat of a a, th a thought experiment. Uh, Hureos and comes from Hora, just a word for time. So uh, even the able uh, commentator Douglas Moo says he doesn't really know for sure what way to go on it. So I'm kind of an interpretive pack rat, so I'll just give you both. One way is obviously the way it's translated, take it as beautiful, almost like pretty, elegant, aesthetically pleasing, glorious. And if that's Paul's meaning, he'd be looking at the beauty of God displayed in giving His Son. And so if I could just communicate that to you with an illustration, consider the Old Testament story of Nabal. Here's this man, he's named Nabal because he was such a fool, he would not listen to anyone. He could not be spoken to. Maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe you are Nabal, I don't know. We were all born, Nabal. But here he is, and Dave and his men need some resources, and they send, you know, for Nabal to help them. <clears throat> and all he does is scorn them and mistreat them. And so, what, what's David's response? I mean, David's the king. And he sent to Nabal, and Nabal responded in this wicked way. How's David going to respond? Well, the text says, you, you wait to see when you're reading it, each man strap on his sword. And they're headed toward the city to destroy it. Listen to this, it's the gospel. When man sinned, and man continued to sin, no doubt the angels wondered Remember, they didn't know this. It was hidden in God. The gospel is now made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. No doubt they wondered, how will God react? And the beauty of the gospel is that when man acted like Nabal, when it came time for God to react, the Apostle John tells us, God so loved Nabal that he gave his one and only son that if he would believe he might have everlasting life. And God did good to his enemies. For God so loved the world. It's the meaning of that term, the sinful, rebellious, Nabalish world perhaps Paul's thinking of that perhaps he's thinking on with the beauty of what he mentioned in Romans 4 one of the most beautiful passages I've ever seen Spurgeon tongue in cheek said and he even in his day there are all these people going on about the names of God you know Jehovah this and that and and they have about all the names you know and he says, this is the only name of God. This is the most important name of God. Him who justifies the ungodly. <laughs> and Spurgeon tried to illustrate what does Paul mean in Romans 4 where he says in verse 5, but to the one who does not work. Has there ever been a point in your life where you had a resolve in your chest that I will not work? Has that ever happened? 
Paul says where that happens to the one who says, I'm not going to do a pilgrimage. I'm not going to mourn. for my, I'm, I'm going to just stand here and be still. To that one and then believes. Why? In him who justifies the ungodly, Spurgeon put it this way. He said, this is what Paul is saying. He said, suppose there was an old painter in England an artist, and he wanted to paint a picture of the town, a candid photo of the town. And so he wanted regular people in there. So he went out and got regular people. Will you come for my painting? And one of the characters he wanted in there was a street sweeper. And so he found a street sweeper. And back in their day, they didn't ride in AC vehicles at Walmart sweeping with vehicles. They had brooms and they were dirty filthy men and so he found one and he said sure I'll come at such such a time okay I'll come and so they come and and, and, the, and the day comes for it to happen and uh, the man showed up and the artist sent him away and everyone was shocked why, why did you send him away and the artist said well because when he showed up Little did I know he had gotten off work the night before. He had gone home and taken a bath and he had taken off his dirty clothes. He found the best outfit he had and he come to the set with that on. And he said, I didn't invite him that way. I invited him as a filthy, wretched street sweeper. And Spurgeon said, Paul is saying, God invites men with all their sin to come. With a filthiness and the dirtiness of it all. That's how we're invited into the picture. He justifies the ungodly. You don't have to get off one single sin to be able to come to Him. Maybe that's what Paul means when he means how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Well, you see why I'm a pack rat, because those are glorious things and true. I'm more inclined in a sort of newish way towards the timely meaning where Paul would be saying how timely because it fits better with the necessity context. And it's what the word itself means. So I was thinking, what does he mean how timely? You've seen this on movies or you've seen it in real life. If you're in a jam and it's waiting till the last minute and then someone, you know what it's like to say, how glad I am to see you. It, that's the sense. So Justin and I were on Catahoula Lake one time Pretty much every hunt and escapade I've gone on to him has been like the Hunger Games or something. <laughs> but this particular one, we were setting up a blind or something before duck season, and uh, we got all the way out there. And I'd never been with him before, but he looked pretty impressive to me. Like he had his boat and this, and I thought, I'm really going with a jam up guy. And so I had a lot of confidence. And so we go out there, and uh, we get all the way out in the middle of cat. We've got our honey bun, and we've got, I mean, everything we need is there. And uh, boating, we get in the blind, and we were missing one tool. One tool. One, one certain Allen wrench. And it was just unbelievable. You're just sitting there in the middle of Catahoula Lake. And you, and you just, I mean, you know how big a chore it is to go all the way back. You just, the whole day is vanity. And you, you try and you just, it was necessary. Now, that Allen wrench would have appeared so much the more beautiful had someone pulled up in a boat and handed me one at that moment because it was so needed. Paul says if you grasp the necessity of the gospel for your salvation, 
every man that has ever spoken it to you will be so precious. How precious is this? Someone giving me this news. That's what makes it so tragic though, isn't it? Look at the tragedy of the news. Number two, the tragedy. Paul says right at that moment, however, got to spoil it. However, they did not all heed the good news. This word heed is like the old English word hearken. Um, like your mom would say to you, uh, listen to me. Uh, are you listening or do you hear me? Or you're not hearing me? Well, she, she doesn't mean you didn't actually hear. She means you didn't hear submissively. You didn't come under what you heard. And this word is hupakuo. And akuo, we get acoustics from, to listen, to hear. And the hupa is to come under. So this word heed is literally to come under what you hear. They did not all submit to the righteousness of God is the idea. Which is why Paul refers to the gospel in certain places as the obedience of faith. It's true that, and Paul would agree, that obedience flows from faith. But it's an epexegetic genitive. It, in my interpretation, it means, and this would be the a proof text I would point to, that he uses it synonymous with heeding, obeying, submitting to. It's the same word in the Greek. Meaning that faith is the act of obedience. Faith involves obedience because it's got to be humble. That's why Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified. This man did not. And he ended the parable by saying, everyone who exalts himself will be humble and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. There's no justification without humility. So in 2 Thessalonians 1.8, Paul talks about people who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is not just a beautiful offer that we heard about a minute ago. It's not just an invitation to come with your sins. It is also a divine command. So in Acts 17, Paul says, God is now commanding all men everywhere to repent. That means if anyone here today is not in Christ and you leave out of this room not in Christ, you leave out of this room having disobeyed a command of God. If it's a command, it's a command to be obeyed or disobeyed. The gospel always comes that way, not just as an invitation and The, the, the reason it requires humility is the way it is, if you think about it. If everything's done, how, how, can, you, how can I put together, I thought of this one walking up here, how to put together the beauty of the gospel and the humility of the gospel. Uh, I'm, I'm using a lot of Spurgeon. Um, he, he said it's like a man... A, a child caught up in a tree, high in a tree, and now you can't get out. And the child is holding on to this limb so that they don't fall. And their father <clears throat> is down there at the bottom and saying, like, I will catch you, just let go. Just let go. Now, that's both beautiful and humbling. At the same time, it's beautiful to be not dependent on you at all and someone else just to catch you. And that's what faith is, just falling upon Christ. But it's also humiliating to, to, to just let go and fall limp from a tree and to look so weak. And that's why the Gospel is an offense to the flesh. Everyone is holding on to something. 
Paul, I've often put it this way, that it's not the yes of the gospel that's so offensive so much as it's the no of the gospel. It's Christ and not this. Christ and not that. So in Galatians 5, Paul says, if I still preach circumcision, then the stumbling block of the cross has been removed. So if I say no to circumcision, that's the stumbling block of the cross. So you're there, let go. There's no salvation in holding on to that. So you, you, in order to preach the gospel accurately, it's not enough to be positive. It is this way and not that way. This way and not that way. How many times does the Apostle John do that in this letter? It is this, not that. This, not that. And we've not been a faithful witness if we don't have this and not that type of speaking. He said, you'll be my witnesses, and that's what it is to do. Um, I mentioned Jason Myers. I was listening to a sermon of his a while back, and I don't know where this church was, but I thought of it again this morning. He, he said there was some church and the kids were having a car wash to go on some trip and um, they were just washing people's vehicles for free. Uh, someone was paying them to do it, I don't know, but they were, they were just doing a good deed in the community washing. That's what it was. They weren't getting paid. They were just doing it as an illustration of the gospel. They were washing people's vehicles for free. And so this one guy pulls in with a humongous mud truck now, he did not realize they were doing it for free. And so he pulls in and it is just, and he thinks, well, I'll, this would be good. I'll get two things. I'll get my truck clean and I'll do a good deed. Like I'll pay him a lot to do this. So he didn't feel bad for doing it. And he just sat there and after just towels started piling up and just everybody sweating, all hands on deck, like an hour later, he's just, man. And they, they pull his truck up to him and he starts pulling out money. And they say, oh no, it's free. Like salvation. And he just, no, no, I'm letting him And he, he tries again to give him something. No, really, it's free. You see smiling kids. You know, it's free. Like salvation. And he tries again, and then the adults have to come over. And before it ended, the man got in his truck, he threw some money at him, slammed his door, and peeled out down the road. Why? Because of the human ego. That's why. That is the offense of the cross is that you can't do anything but trust in the shameful crucified one. And that is both beautiful and humbling at all at the same time, which incidentally is why Paul said God did it that way so that no flesh may boast before God. But by his doing, we're in Christ. And so why Paul says that the Jews were not submitting to the righteousness of God, seeking to establish their own. So they did not all heed the good news. You may feel like that here today. You may feel like my church is small. You may feel like my influence is small. You may be being pressed to produce more. You might be like Isaiah, like, I got Isaiah 53, but Lord, who has believed my report? I mean, when I, can't, when I compare my output and my input, it just doesn't seem to be working. Well, one thing I noticed, you notice the so of verse 17. I notice Paul does not draw this conclusion. He doesn't say, so let's change it up a bit. Thank you. He doesn't say so, let's change it up a bit. 
He, he doesn't cave to people who are telling him, well, Paul, they're just not, it's not working. They're, they're not going to listen to that message. Can't you see you're doing something wrong? You don't know how to win friends and influence people. There are several places where Paul faces his objection. You remember one of them perhaps is in 1 Corinthians 1. I mean, he was aware. He was not dumb. He was aware. He says, I know what Jews are seeking. They want signs. And I know what Greeks are seeking. They want wisdom. This is what Sai is telling us. They, they want you to go this route, right? That's what they want. Get a philosophy degree. Talk about metaphysics, epistemology, and every other kind of word you can think of. What does Paul say? But we preach. It's a contrast. But we preach Christ crucified. A message they do not want. Why, Paul? Look how look at it. Well, then they're then they're scandalized, Paul. Then then they say it's foolishness. And he says, Yes, but to the called. He asked us that question last night, and I talk to people all the time about these terms myself. But if I were put on the stand because I saw Christ. Because God who said light shall shine out of darkness shone in my heart. The glory of God in the face of Christ. That's why I'm a believer. Because I've seen nothing more glorious than Christ crucified. It's the pearl of great price. The treasure in a field. And like Paul said, everything is dumb compared to that. And therefore, Paul says, I consider my life as not worth anything that I may gain Him. And that love of Christ constrains you. Does it constrain you? Why are you here? Why are you everywhere you're at? What church, whatever... If it's not the love of Christ constrains me in my heart, there's something wrong with your heart. I mean, the real answer would be, if I ask you, someone could just give him Peter's answer. Where else will we go? I don't have anywhere else to go. He has the words of eternal life. Paul dealt with it with the Corinthians many times because they wanted something. Well, 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 people want this kind of a preacher, and they and, and they really want. And he says, look, in chapter two, the, the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. In other words, if what you're giving people is what they already want without the help of the Holy Spirit, you can know you're not giving them the gospel. Because the gospel is something that no one is looking for and has never entered into their heart. And it will always cause a tragedy. And that's why in Acts, it's always some sneered, some believed. Some said this, some joined in. And the word kept increasing. Luke keeps writing that over and over and over again. What is the kingdom of God like? Jesus said. The seed which grows and grows and grows. He dealt with it again to the Corinthians. I won't take our time to turn to it, but if our gospel is veiled, what's wrong with Paul? And there's, all the, there's always these articles. The church isn't being the church. It's always blaming the church for why the world does not come to the gospel. I mean, I think Paul would have told so many of these strategists, well, why Paul, he would have said, if my gospel is veiled, it's demonic. It's veiled because the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. The social justice movement is, as has been pointed out 
uh, by so many who are more able than me to mention it. I've just recently grasped what they've been trying to say. But about half of my Christian life, I missed this, this 1 Corinthians 9 thing of becoming all things, right? Well, you've got, you've got to become, yes. But I finally realized both in the text and through a Lord of the Rings movie. You remember when Gandalf had to go in and free King Theoden from the spell? And he had to get his staff in there. And, and they, were, they were letting all their weapons out. And he was pretending to be this old man. And the guy tried, and he's like, oh, you wouldn't part an old man from his walking stick, would you? Okay. Get in. And so it's, it's hidden. He gets in, and he frees the man with his staff. Well, the gospel is like that staff. So whatever you do in the get in, if you've got to let go of the gospel to get in, you can't do anything when you get in. Who, who will you free? Just go sit by the dead man? So whatever, whoever is asking me, yes, you may need to go to a ball game. You may need to go to an event. You, you may need to do all manner of cultural stuff that is not sinful. But you cannot let go of that. And you can see it in the text. Paul is saying that he became that and he became that. But that he may win them to the Gospel. He does everything for the sake of the Gospel. Meaning he never let go of it. And if someone requires you to do that, then just don't go. Not letting go of it. Well, as we come back to the text to close, you've seen the necessity and the tragedy and now how Paul is bringing it back to the necessity of again saying the tragedy doesn't change the necessity of it. He ends with saying so. Even though there's tragedy when it's preached, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word about Christ. In 2 Timothy 3, Paul's last letter, he's having to tell Timothy, he says, in the last days, difficult times are going to come. And he basically describes men being sinful. They're like, well, Paul, I thought people were always this way and that way and jealous and self-pleasing and well yeah but this is going to be in the church mixed in there and and all of this is going to come upon Timothy and um, alluding to Jason Myers again in his New Testament class I sat in I was sitting there and he's basically making running commentary through the New Testament we got to 2 Timothy 3 and he asked this he asked our class this question he said what is the secret weapon that Paul gives Timothy to be able to overcome all of these difficulties in ministry? And he says, the Scripture. He tells him to preach the Word. And particularly, Jason brought out this illustration of inspiration. He says, it's, it's God-breathed. And he goes back to Adam in Genesis 2-7. He says, what Paul is telling Timothy is, as Adam lay there on the ground, for all intents and purposes, lifeless and dead, and God breathed into him the breath of life, Jason said what Paul is saying to Timothy is, the breath of life is in this book. Man is dead. You must lay this book upon man the way Elijah and Elisha laid their mouths and their bodies on top of dead people that they may live. And some will not. You're always Ezekiel, right? You know, Lord, who will live. Some will not. But know this, anyone who is alive can live. Not because of them. There is no life in them. Very dry. But this book is not very dry. There is life in it. So. Conclude.
conclusion number one to everyone here is through song, through preaching, you've heard the gospel. You've heard that the gospel of Jesus Christ is that the second person of the Trinity took on flesh so that he was truly God and truly man in one person. And as a second Adam, he lived from the incarnation all the way to the crucifixion, a life of righteousness. Israel in the wilderness, like Adam, but not like him. Like Israel, but not like her. Like all the kings in the books of kings, but not like him. He tore down the high places. And he was the righteous one. And he, he did that righteous life that you haven't lived. And then as a result of the sinful life you have lived, he fulfilled the law also in dying for you. When he was crucified, he was punished for every sin that has ever been committed. And, and your sin was counted to him. And he paid for it. And the proof that it was paid for. What's the proof that a sentence in prison is over? The prison doors swing open and the person is now free. The proof that the sentence was paid is the resurrection. He was raised for our justification. Romans 4.25 And now he ever lives to make intercession. He, he rose from the dead. He appeared to witnesses. He ascended into heaven. And he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's been building his kingdom for 2,000 years. And at the last trump, he will return. And all who are in the graves will come forth. And he will judge every man, woman, boy, and girl who has ever lived. And he will either say to every one of us in this room, depart from me. For I never knew you. Or he will say, enter into the joy of your master. And if you're not in him, if you have not come to him and trusted in him, you will suffer eternal conscious torment forever and ever and ever without him. And if you have come to him, you will enjoy going on eternal life, knowing the Lord. John 17, 3, or Ephesians 2, the immeasurable greatness of his kindness that has been shown so that throughout all the ages he may display it to us. So that's one conclusion. The second one is not everyone here is preachers. Um, I began my two sermons with a story. I'll end them with one. This one is uh, called The Crow in the Pitcher. There was once a thirsty crow, and he saw a pitcher of water, a pitcher that had some water in it, and he flew down to quench his thirst so that he wouldn't die, and discovered that the water was too far down into the pitcher, and his beak could not reach it. And so he got sad for a moment, but then he thought of something. And he went and he fetched ice cubes. And he kept putting in ice cubes until the pitcher, until the water rose to where he could reach it. And he drank the water and he lived. And the fable ends with saying, necessity is the mother of all invention. Don't hear Paul say, the necessity of the gospel and quarrel against it, but be inventive with it. Let the necessity not to change it, but write a song, write a book, preach a sermon, have a conversation, go, go hunting with somebody, go fishing with somebody, have someone over, go what think of ways, don't let the necessity of the word debilitate you, let it drive you to get the word to your, your wife, your family, your children, your grandchildren, because faith comes from hearing alone.